Hi, my name is Mark Feldhammer with Logic Data. Welcome to our presentation on APS, Advanced Planning and Scheduling Basics. A little background on myself, I'm the president and founder of Logic Data. Logic Data is a software services firm headquartered in Denver and servicing North America. We're an Infor Gold Channel partner focused on the Sightline ERP system. That has been our focus for nearly 30 years. Our team of experts has successfully implemented over 250 ERP systems in manufacturing companies and continue to help our customers today be successful. Our agenda for this presentation, we're going to look at APS planning and scheduling logic and contrast it with material requirements planning. We're going to discuss the planning logic, how APS actually thinks. If you're interested in capacity planning, we'll look at how that's set up and defined and used. And then the overall system setup and key to all of this success for you is what management actions are required to make an APS implementation successful. Let's start off with contrasting APS and MRP. Firstly, what is MRP? This is the definition from the APIX dictionary, but simply put, this is a set of techniques developed in the late 50s and early 60s of the last century to help plan inventory replenishments to satisfy customer demand. MRP has a very basic simple algorithm and this simplistic diagram will give you a sense of that. What we're showing here are potentially three customer orders, three end items due at let's say different dates and each of them has a indented bill of material and perhaps a routing. When MRP looks at these demands it starts at the topmost level and nets together all the similar requirements in order to figure out what it needs to build or buy at this top level. Then MRP blows down into the second tier of the bill of material based on the requirements of that first tier and again nets these together to similar requirements and carries on to the lowest level. MRP planning is level by level across all items of your bill of material. Seems simple, but what's wrong with that picture? MRP has some fundamental flaws things that it can't do because its logic is limited. Firstly, MRP will oftentimes tell you that you should have done something in the past. It may recommend a purchase order should have been released last week or a job should have been put out on the floor for manufacturing last month. MRP does not consider the capacity of your plant. So as it plans this, it assumes infinite capacity, it assumes you have the machines and the people to do the jobs based on the routings that you've defined. If you have constraints and something really can't be done, MRP doesn't predict when it can be done. If you have a glitch in your supply chain, let's say a purchase order is coming in late or a machine goes down, that means that the orders associated with that are going to be late, but MRP does not have the logic to tell you when you will be late. So. What's APS and how is this different? Nice quote from Marilyn Van Eck. And this is a very nice statement about APS. It says, you know, this is a very powerful system. It's going to do a lot for you. But let's take a look at what makes this truly possible. APS is a replacement for MRP. You don't run MRP and APS. There are some systems out there that use MRP and call themselves APS, but that's not a true APS environment. APS was initially developed theoretically in the 1990s, and at that point in time it took pretty big computers to run an APS environment. However, now we have technology that allows us to run it on a, even a desktop computer because computers have gotten so much faster. Rather than netting level by level like MRP does, APS plans the replenishment of each demand individually. And, if you so wish, it can look at your actual capacities and constrain the plan by your capacity. In any event, APS will load your capacity and tell you how much capacity is required to meet your plan. It then projects when that requirement can be replenished. It tells you, this customer order, the customer wants you to ship it on Wednesday, 
based on material constraints and shop floor constraints, maybe it really can't ship till Friday. And once you've accepted APS's plan, it actually reserves the inventory, the purchase order supply, the jobs on the floor, the machines, the people necessary to do the work, and locks them in against that promise. This gives you the confidence that when you tell the customer we can ship this on a given date, you really can. So back to our simple diagram, how is this different from MRP? If you recall, MRP took the top level three requirements and planned them all together and then went down level by level. APS, on the other hand, looks at the earliest, most important requirement based on the priorities you've established, crawls down its routing and bill of material, ascertains where the materials are going to be coming from and what equipment and people are required, and locks that in before it moves on to the next priority demand. And it moves across all the demands one by one in priority order through all the levels of the bombs of each demand. And when it's done, then it nets together similar requirements for efficiency purposes. So you might get one purchase order for a common component across all three demands. Let's look at some examples of how APS actually thinks. Let's assume that we've got a customer order that was placed with this due date here, and each of these vertical lines would be one day. And there's a final assembly that we have to manufacture to meet that customer order. There's a routing associated with that final assembly, Operation 10, 20, and 30. APS backwards plans the routing, each of these steps taking two days, and determines when that routing needs to start. In the bill of material for the assembly, there is, of course, a subassembly or some components. APS sees that we must have that subassembly by this date, and it then plans the routing for the subassembly, two days for Operation 20 and three days for Operation 10. Beneath these, perhaps we need material for Operation 20, and it's got a two-day lead time. And we need material for Operation 10. It also has a two-day lead time. So APS sees that we can start today, order this very first material, and successfully complete everything in time for the customer due date. But what do we do if we hit today? If APS says, I can't make this in time, and let's say simplistically that last material here has a three-day lead time, which means we would have had to order it yesterday. One of the benefits of APS is it knows you don't have a time machine. It's not going to make you travel back to yesterday and place that purchase order. Instead, APS is going to look at that and say, I can't order that material until today, which means I can't start the subassembly for another day. The second operation gets moved out. This material is not required for another day. The subassembly won't be ready until here and the whole final assembly gets moved out an extra day. APS will then return a projected date of one day past the due date. You now know when you honestly can get this work done. What if we wanted to consider capacity with APS? Well, there's a little explanation required up front before we do that. APS can consider capacity. It always loads your capacity, whether you're finite or infinite model, but let's take a look at the difference between finite capacity planning and infinite capacity planning. Here we have an example. We have a work center that's open eight hours a day, five days a week. We have two jobs that both need to run through that work center, and they both take 16 hours of work. When APS plans this in a finite model, it will look at the highest priority job, and load it starting Monday, assuming that's tomorrow, and it will run it through Tuesday. Then it looks at job number two. It was also due on Tuesday, but we are at 100% of capacity. So APS will level load. It won't try to force that job into the same work center on Monday and Tuesday. Instead, it sees I can't go above 100%, and it places the job on Wednesday and Thursday. The job will be two days late but that's all the capacity that you have. But what happens if you say, I want to use an infinite model? We take the same two jobs and we ask APS to load them. APS loads job one on the same two days as we did before. But then when it comes to loading job two, APS knows you have infinite capacity. So it loads job two 
on top of job one on the same two days. That resource, that work center, that machine, that person, is now booked at 200% of capacity. There's some advantages to this. If you have flexible capacity, you look at this chart and you go, oh, I need 200%, I need another person on that day, or I need to run an extra shift. Whereas if you look at a finite model and you see this job is late, now you have to figure out, well, where am I going to put that job in order to make it happen on time? So an infinite model is a good model if you're driven by customer due dates no matter what and you will make your shop work the extra time, get the products done somehow. So how does this look? Let's say that on this day right here, Work Center 20 was booked. We had no capacity available. Something else was already running in that Work Center or the equipment's down for maintenance. We take our final assembly due on this day and we try to backward plan it. Operation 30 at, let's say, Work Center 30 can occur. There's no constraints. Operation 20, however, APS sees it can't really run it on those dates. It has to go back a day. So now there's a gap in our routing between Operation 20 and Operation 30, and then it plans Operation 10, plans the material for Operation 10, and you're set. You can make this job happen in time, but APS has worked around the constraints of your capacity. When you define your capacity, these are the four key points you need to look at in setting up the system so that it thinks for you. You have to define your resources. What people do you have? What machines do you have? And then you have to define the resource groups. These people belong to my quality control. These people belong to my CNC operation. These people run my paint booths. Or the machines themselves. So these three CNCs have similar capacity, so they belong to the same resource group. You define your shifts. Are you an eight hour a day, five day a week shop? Do you run double shifts? Do you run four 10 hour days? Do different resources work on different shifts? So APS knows who's available to do what work when. And then of course, as you define your products, you have to define your routings. What operation steps do they go through? And at each step, what resource groups and how many resources are required to do that step? And what's your time standards? Does it take one hour per piece, a day per piece? Can you make a thousand pieces a day? So you define your routings and all these data elements come together to help APS think through your capacity issues. When we look at a resource, let's say we're talking about people, people can have multiple skill sets. So we associate people potentially with different resource groups. In this example, we may say Joe is a CNC operator and Ann is only on the brake press. But Bob has been trained for both, so we make Bob a member of both groups. APS can then select the resources available based on what those people have already been booked to and also based on what shift those individuals work on. By the same token, you would do this with your machines. You might have three similar CNC machines they work both shifts because we don't have to give them time off. And so we make all three machines a member of the same CNC group. And when APS sees it needs one CNC machine to run an operation, it will pick one out of the appropriate group. If you embark on a project to deploy APS, I'd like to give you some management pointers that are important to your success. In telling APS how to plan your production, the data you feed it is critical to the accuracy of its output. It's important that you dedicate the appropriate personnel to maintaining these data elements so you can act on the output of APS with confidence. We need to know what materials are required to make something, so your bill of material needs to be pretty accurate. Your inventory levels and your counts of inventory should be good, so we highly recommend an efficient cycle counting program be ongoing to make sure inventory is correct. Periodically, you should analyze your lead times from your vendors and also analyze your routings and your run times and make sure those data elements are correct in your software. Just a comment, this applies to both APS and MRP. Whether you're running one or the other, you need the same data elements, a little more in APS for resources and resource groups, but both need routings, bills of materials, inventory, and bombs to be highly accurate. Additionally, as a manager, be aware of these fundamental points. Don't expect that people will understand APS just because they know MRP. 
give them the opportunity to be educated in the new system. Extend their education to all areas of the manufacturing process. The American Production and Inventory Control Society has a wonderful set of courses for manufacturing managers that will cover capacity planning, scheduling, just-in-time, Kanban, inventory control, and so forth. One time through the materials is not enough. If you attend one education class, you're basically familiar, but you're not an expert. Make sure your people recognize it takes time to really grasp this, and they should read and reread the manuals. Once the system is deployed, insist that it be used. Don't tolerate outside systems, such as spreadsheets, as that just means that something wasn't set up right in your system and allows people to ignore the problem. Following on that point, as you find a problem in the system, fix it. If a buyer sees that APS is recommending a purchase order too late, make sure he finds the correct lead time and fixes the problem. And everybody touches the system, so it's everybody's job. You wouldn't borrow someone's car and see that it was almost out of gas and ignore it. You would take care of it. Just like you wouldn't look at an inventory record that was wrong and ignore it, you should fix it. It's everyone's job to make sure the software works. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. If you have questions, feel free to contact us at the number shown below or my email address. Have a great day.